Okay. Now that I've stopped recording randomly and started streaming instead, we can just wait patiently for it to tell me I've gone live. Hopefully we shouldn't have any interruptions like yesterday. And my little block should stay green the entire time. Just gonna wait till it tells me. Oh, there we go. We are now officially live with part six of my build for the Beamtown Bullies for Commander. Alright, so yesterday we had a little bit of an internet issue and I kept redlining over on my Streamlab setup, or my OBS setup rather. So, I had to cut that short. So we had started to look at Dissension. As I was saying, if I didn't get cut off or garbled too much by the stream dropping frames and going in and out, um, I'm not expecting this set to have much. It has the original Rakdos uh, cards, and most of the green cards in the set will be focused on... Uh, Simic, which had a plus one planet, plus one plus one counter theme with Graft, which we're not too interested in. Also, Rakdos had the Hellbent mechanic, which is the empty-handed mechanic, where you got a bonus if you had no cards in hand. So both of those do not exactly help. That is true, though. We do get original Blood Crypt, so. Blood Crypt is definitely going on the list. Alright. Additional cost pay X life, and each other player loses X life. I don't think we need that. We can't run the split card because half of it's blue green. Uh, Brain Pry. Name a non-land card. Target player reveals their hand. That player discards a card with that name. If they can't, you draw a card. Um, whenever a player other than Bronze Bombshell's owner controls it, that player sacrifices it. If that player does, Bronze Bombshell deals 7 damage to them. Well, that is our whole deck is giving our opponents our stuff. We can technically cast Bronze Bombshell as a 4-drop, even though she only has one toughness and is likely to explode, but not in the way we want her to. That's fine. If she trades for anything or holds off an attacking creature for a turn or two and then goes to the graveyard... Perfectly acceptable. So Bronze Bombshell is a 4-drop. Four 4-1. Four Construct. Uh, when a player other than Bronze Bombshell's owner controls it. So yeah, they don't have to gain control of it for her to trigger. It's if they control her. So... Sacrifice it. I don't know why I spelled out sacrifice now when I haven't been doing it the whole time. And it deals seven damage to them. Okay. Uh, deals three damage to target creature or player. Hellbent deals five. That has white in it. Crypt Champion comes into play. Each player puts a creature card with CMC 3 or less from their graveyard into play and then sacrifice if he didn't pay red. Graft 4. Um, when it comes into play, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each other creature you control that has a counter on it already and pay 2 to move a counter from target creature you control onto this. And graph 6. Target creature with a counter on it gains trample. Each player discards three cards. 
Deals X damage to target creature or player. Uh, creature dealt damage gets exiled if it would die. And Hellbent can't be countered by spells or abilities and the damage can't be prevented. Hellbent gets a bonus. There's the other half of Bound and Determined. Dread Slag. Uh, nope. Uh, Drekavak. When Drekavak comes into play, sacrifice it unless you discard a non-creature card. Doesn't work, they will just sacrifice the Drekavak rather than do what we want them to. Beginning of your pre-combat main phase, add mana equal to enchanted permanence mana cost. No. Pro multicolored. Uh, sacrifice the target player loses one life and you gain one life and you get it back when you multicolor spell. It's a Simic artifact. Can't run blue. Uh, choose a card type. Target opponent reveals his or her hand. Put two 1-1 one, one sapperlings into play for each card of the chosen type. Uh, when another creature comes into play, sacrifice this. If you do, it deals four damage to that creature. Hmm. So we can use this in response to a creature spell that the opponent is casting to give them this and deal four damage to their creature. Eh, we can add it to the list. If it feels too low powered, we can get rid of it. Flame can war scout is three in red, two four. Elemental scout, scout, and another creature. ETBs sack this, and it deals. Four damage to that creature. Okay. Flaring Flame can, as long as it's enchanted, gets plus two, plus two, trample, and has fire breathing. Uh, put a 1 1 green sapperling creature into play, blocking target creature that's attacking you. Okay, so this is one of those cards. There's something that made me think of cards that blocked a creature. This one does put a 1-1 one, one into play. There are spells that treat the creature as though it were blocked, and there is actually nothing in front of it, so Trample just goes over it. But I forget the context now. I forget what card made me start talking about those effects. I know I shorthanded it and pointed out that technically the shorthand didn't work if you had one of those effects. Uh, can't be blocked by flyers. Uh, Hellbent, it gets plus one, plus O, oh, and can be regenerated. Hellhole Rats is haste, and comes into play. Target player discards a card, and Hellhole Rats deals damage to that player equal to that card's converted mana cost. Alright, so Hit and Run are the only split card in this set that we could run, because it is the Jun colors. Hit is as I tilt my head sideways. Target player sacrifices an artifact or creature. Hit deals damage to that player equal to that permanent's converted mana cost. And run is attacking creatures you control get plus one plus zero until end of turn for each other attacking creature. Well, we're not a go-wide strategy and we don't really care about the sacrifice from hit, so we're going to keep going. Ignorant Bliss exiles your hand until end of turn and then lets you draw a card and put your hand back. Uh, just to give you Hellbent when you don't want to actually get rid of all of your cards. Uh, Indrix Stomp Howler is one of the non... Like, you can't not destroy an artifact or enchantment if there is one. So, if we're going to run effects like that, we want the ones that are not optional. So that when we give them to other players, they have to blow up stuff. Four and a green. Four, four beast. ETB. Naturalize. 
Infernal Tutor, we can only cast that when we have no hand, because otherwise we have to search for a copy of a card in our hand. I guess technically we can get a basic land with that, but that seems terrible. Uh, Poppet is, uh, when Jag whenever Dragon Poppet is dealt damage, whenever it's dealt damage, discard that many cards. So, we're going to be giving this away, so they have to attack with it. If somebody else blocks, it just nukes their hand. Yes. It's one. Black, red. There's a three, four. Ogre, warrior. Uh, whenever... This is dealt damage I discard oops, discard that many cards hellbent when this deals combat damage to a player that player discards that many cards. Okay. Uh, whoops. I accidentally clicked off. From my perspective anyway, they should have still stayed up on the screen for viewers. Uh, tax each turn if able. Black sacrifice it the next time damage would be dealt to target creature this turn. Destroy that creature instead. Yeah, since damage no longer goes on the stack, that is not a particularly useful ability. Discard a card at random. If you do, Kindle the Carnage deals damage equal to that card CMC to each creature. You may repeat this process any number of times. No. Uh, Loming Shaman comes into play. Target player shuffles any number of target cards from his or her graveyard into his or her library. Uh, sacrifice Lizolda. Uh, sacrifice a creature. Lizolda the Blood Witch deals two damage to target creature or player. If the sacrifice creature was red, draw a card. And if it was, oh wait, hang on. Oh wait, she deals two damage to that player. If the sacrifice creature was red, you draw a card. If it was black, okay. There we go. Found the actual wording. Stop trying to tell myself what the card did and actually read it instead. Much more effective. Uh, two target creature cards from your graveyard to your hand, then discard a card. Untap, untap target creature that has a tap activated ability. Alright, so Mage Right Stone is the thing that I knew was either in this block or... Oh no, I was thinking of Thousand Year Elixir when I was talking about that card. That was another one that's either in uh, Time Spiral block or... Lorwyn, and I can't remember which one, but Magewrite Stone lets us untap the Beamtown Bullies so that we can get more activations. So it's a two drop art as one tap to untap target creature that has a tap activated. Ability. Alright. Oh, we found a lot more cards in Dissension than I thought we were going to. It's plus two, plus two until end of turn for each of its colors. Yeah, even plus six, plus six on the bullies is not super impressive. Muse Vessel, three tap target player, removes a card in his or her hand from the game. Use this at sorcery speed, and one, choose a card removed from the game with Muse Vessel. You may play that card this turn. And Enchanted Creature attacks or blocks as controller loses three life, and red and one Enchanted Creature attacks if able. Uh, all creatures become black, all lands become swamps until end of turn. Black and two, discard a card, target opponent loses one life, and you gain one life. Hellbent. Spend one and pay two life, draw a card. New vision is Simic Land. Gatecrasher comes into play. Destroy target creature with Defender. I mean, unless you are... 
like if your play group regularly includes uh, decks that are running um, the more recent printing of Arcady Sabbath, the one that allows your defenders to attack and lets your creatures deal combat damage based on their toughness. If you frequently have to play against a deck like that, Ogre Gate Crasher, definitely something you want because you can give this, whoever you give this to, they have to destroy a creature with Defender if able, so in that regard, I would consider Ogre Gate Crasher. I have played against an Arcade Sabbath deck. Uh, it was one when I had a more consistent play group until the one shop stopped hosting events. Um, but even that player had multiple decks and wouldn't always play Arcades, so I doubt we would be able to find room for this just as the generic version of the deck. So I think we are not going to include it. But just for uh, personal builds, if you know you are going to be playing against somebody who has built Arcades and that is their only deck, unless you feel like you're picking on them too much. But if their deck is one of the stronger decks in your playgroup, feel free to put Ogre Great Crasher into either build of this deck and use it to destroy their large uh, defense creatures that have Defender. Uh, whenever an opponent is dealt three or more damage by a single source, that player discards a card. <clears throat> uh, when Patagia... Oh, right, this one, you have to pay blue or sacrifice it, so that one's not going to work anyway. Uh, can only be used to cast multicolor spells. Ah, good old Protean Hulk. Definitely not something we want to give to other players, as Protean Hulk is a massive combo enabler. Uh, as evidenced by the deck that destroyed Legacy for the one event where it was legal. Uh, so we definitely don't want to give it to other players, and because of that, we probably don't want it ourselves. Target multicolored card creature gains double strike until end of turn and draw a card. Most of the stuff, most of the stuff that we have that we're giving out is not actually multicolored. So Psychotic Fury is not going to do the job that we would need it to. It's not going to be another Temer Battle Rage in our deck. Can't run those. Ragamuffin, you need to be hellbent. Sacrifice a creature or a land, draw a card. Uh, Reign of Gore is if a spell would cause its controller to gain life, that player loses that much life instead. We're not a life gain deck. This is a fine card to include as an anti-life gain card. If you're looking for that, again, if the prevailing strategy in your playgroup includes a lot of life gain, we can certainly uh, add Reign of Gore to stop that. But I don't think it's necessary. Rakdos Augur Mage is one of the invitational cards. This is one of the ones that never took off because while its effect is unique and it is certainly playable, it was never great, unfortunately. So it allows you and your opponent to each look at the other's hand and then discard a card from each other's hands. Um, you reveal first and discard a card of that opponent's choice so that way you know what you are losing and then the opponent will discard their card. This is not a good card for Commander, especially because you only get one opponent's thing. So unless you desperately want to discard your own hand... Uh, the Augur Mage is never going to get you the advantages that you want from its ability. You'll be left uh, with no cards in hand most of the time, and opponents will just have uh, free reign. Like you'll, you'll, you might decimate one player's hand or get a card from one player's hand each round, but then you're not getting them from you know. Like if you're targeting one player, then the other players all get a card draw at least by the time it gets back around to you to activate this again, yeah. yeah it's, it was an interesting design, but it never did anything in any format, because it's it's one of those um, 
fancy plays where the idea was that, oh, cool, I get to, we both have to discard a card of the other player's choice, but I'm going to be the better player, so I'm going to be able to take advantage of that more consistently, and... So that was the mentality of the winner who designed it. I genuinely forget who this card represents now. This is one of the ones that I don't know the name of. As opposed to, like, Darwin Castle, Tiago Chan. Uh, I'm going to horribly mispronounce this person's name. Uh, I always pronounce it Ali Rod. But I think it might be Raid or Rade. Uh, who is Sylvan Safekeeper. Yeah, there, a lot of them I know the names of. Uh, Rakdos Augur Mage, uh, the Sad Robot uh, from Scars of Mirrodin, or not Scars of Mirrodin, original Mirrodin, uh, Psalm Simulacrum. I always forget his name as well, and I've seen his name more times than I have the Rakdos Augur Mage. Um, I was not following Tournament Magic at the time, that's why I don't know uh, Augur Mage or um, Sad Robot's actual, like, who the person who won the tournament and helped design the card and whose face is currently on it. Uh, I did get back into Tournament Magic a little bit after that, which is how I know Tiago Chan is the representative, or is represented by the original Snapcaster Mage artwork. But, yeah, there's a handful of them that I don't know their names because I was not playing... I was not following competitive Magic coverage at the time and so did not know who they were when they were winning in order to qualify for the event that let them participate in the card design. Alright. Um, so, the Karu Lands... Specifically the Ravnica era ones, because the original Karu lands had an extra restriction on them that made them even worse. Um, these can frequently get their way into my decks. Not always, though. I don't know that we need them in this particular build. If you are looking for replacements for some of the more expensive dual lands... Uh, all of the Karu lands are commons, and they've been reprinted a couple of times, typically in master sets, but even still, people open the master sets looking for the more expensive cards from them, and will typically ship the uh, more playable commons, uncommons, and all of the rares and mythics that they weren't looking for. So that hel has helped the price. I don't know what they are currently at, but I believe they are, like, reasonable to acquire, like, somewhere in the $1 to $3 range, as opposed to some of the older rare lands that might be, you know, like, 10 or 15 or $30, or, you know, once we start getting into actual duels, hundreds of dollars, depending. <clears throat> so if you are looking for more budget-friendly alternatives, um... The Karu lands are not the best budget alternative. I honestly think that the best budget alternative is the um, Khans block um, versions of the Refuge lands, which all they all tap for two colors of mana, come into play tapped, and gain you a life. Those things have been reprinted to death and back in several sets, and they are extremely cheap, and most of the time they function close enough to what you need them to, like I've said before. In le there will be times where you'll play your seventh land, and it comes in a play tapped, and you'll wish it didn't, but nine times out of ten you will play this in like the first couple turns of the game, and then cast your cool spell, and you'll be just fine. Like, you don't need the most expensive lands possible for your mana base. I am going to include them, because if I build the deck, I will absolutely run the lands that I have. But it is not necessary. Like, even more so... Even more so than the spells that will do cool things and will interact with the deck in interesting ways, the lands you can get by with just running the cheaper versions of them. And be just fine. Uh, yeah, 
I don't think we need Rakdos Guild Mage. Um, Ixpitter deals a damage, and then that creature's controller loses a life. <clears throat> Isn't really doing much for us. The Pit Dragon is needs mana gain flying, needs mana to pump itself. Does gain double strike when you're hellbent, but that's not really anything we're doing, so... Reach blood counter on it and has tap sacrifice a creature. Put a blood counter on the right knife, and for two mana, you can sacrifice the knife itself and have target player sacrifice a permanent for each blood counter that was on the knife. Eh, probably not. Alright. We will add Rakdos Signet to the list. I do like to have about. I want to say between 5 and 10. 10 is ten's probably too much, but usually around 5 to 7 um, artifact mana sources that are relatively cheap to cast, usually. And the Signets are usually on the short list, along with Arcane Signet, um, the Skyclave Relic, uh, Coalition Relic will usually have a good chance of making in there. The, those are the ones, or if I have not a lot of colored requirements, ones like uh, Hedron Archive, um, Thran Dynamo, Warm Power Stone will make the cut instead. If the deck is particularly mana hungry, then we might get like 10 to 12 sources of artifact mana into the deck. But yeah, we're just going to put Rakdos Signet on the list, and we will probably add the Gruul and... Um, uh, Golgari signets at a later date. There's Rakdos the Defiler. He is after Phage, this is the one I am most sad about the non-legendary restriction on the Beamtown Bullies. Uh, when he attacks, sacrifice half your non-demon permanents rounded up. When he deals combat damage to a player, that player sacrifices half their non-demon permanents also rounded up, and he is a 7-6 flying trample. Like, that thing is absolutely perfect for what we are trying to do with Beamtown Bullies, and it makes me so sad that he is legendary, that it is Rakdos, and therefore legendary, and that we can't do that. <clears throat> and I am almost entirely positive that the reason why we can't do it is because of Phage. Like, they remembered Phage exists, and they're like, well, how do we stop them from just one-shotting a random player? And the answer was, we make it non-legendary. Meanwhile, there are plenty of other cards that basically one-shot a player, and those are all just fine, I guess. In the meantime, we had to have that wording to deny us the fun of a card like Rakdos. Uh, beginning of your upkeep, you may search for a rat, and reveal it and put it in your hand, that... We are not searching for rats, unfortunately. Uh, enchanted creature gets plus two, minus one. No. Rick's Mahdi is the black red one. Each player discards a card. Play this ability only any time you could activate a sorcery. There's the run half of hit and run. Uh, the red Eidolon, uh, you sacrifice it so target creature can't block this turn. Comes back with multicolor spells. Uh, there are the seals, which, because you wanted to discard your hand with a Rakdos build, they wanted you to have, you know, removal that you could put into play and have sit there, and then you could have an empty hand without not without getting into the position where you don't have answers. They're just on board now, and your opponent can see them. Or you could always use them as sorcery speed removal by casting them and activating them immediately on their resolution. Uh, the Basilisk has whenever a creature with a plus one, plus one counter on it. Deals combat damage to a creature. Destroy it at end of combat. Yeah, nope. Ragworm is blue. Pure and simple. Skullmead Cauldron. Taps to gain a life and taps to discard a card to gain three life. Yeah, that wasn't even good when you wanted to discard your whole hand for effects. I have... I mean, it's an uncommon, and it's meant to help your um, limited decks do what they're supposed to do, but god, is that terrible. Like, you could have made this like a two-drop, and it would have been fine. Uh, the Slaughterhouse Bouncer is put into a graveyard. It gives minus three, minus three, 
if you had no hand. This one can attack as though it didn't have defender. It's a shade for one mana and is an excellent mana sink when, when you have no cards in hand and need something to do with that mana. Though it is in a gold set where you're less likely to have an entire mana base of black mana in front of you. So that kind of ate into its utility also. Uh, this one regenerates creatures with counters. As Squealing Devil comes into play, you may pay X. If you do, target creature gets plus X plus zero. He's a 2-1 fear, and if the other mana spent to play him wasn't black, you sacrifice him. Alright, so here is Stalking Vengeance. Whenever another creature you control is put into a graveyard from play, it deals damage equal to its power to target player. So, we plan to grab our own stuff back and sacrifice it, and that stuff will have very high power, as we've seen with things like Eater of Days. So, Stalking Vengeance has a tremendous chance of being a finisher for another player after we've, you know, after we've harmed the one player by giving it this terrible creature and potentially shutting them out of the game and forcing them to bludgeon another player with it. If we can steal it back and sacrifice it for our own value, Stalking Vengeance is going to deal a lot of damage on top of that and put the creature, and we're putting the creature back in the graveyard. It might be a win more card if we're already doing all of that, but it's also a thing we can be doing if we're giving out creatures that aren't necessarily, like, game ending for the person we're giving them to. So, 5 red red for a 5-5 five, five avatar. It has haste. And when an, it is another, yeah. I control dies. That creature, right? It is the other creature is the source, right? Whenever another creature you control dies, it deals damage equal to its power to target player. So that creature deals damage equal to its power to target player. Can this hit Planeswalkers? It might be all hit Planeswalkers. It might have gotten the errata. Yep, okay. So it can hit Planeswalkers. Or Planeswalker. Okay. Stompin' House, destroy target artifact, and target enchantment. <clears throat> so there are a lot of effects like this, and I do believe running like one or two of them is always a good idea. We have better options though, and this one does require both targets. If it was destroy up to one target artifact and up to one target enchantment, uh, it would be much better. We will have access though to cards like... Um, Casualties of War, which is a much better removal spell. Granted, it costs twice as much mana as this, but the power and versatility is fine. Usually you don't need to be able to destroy artifacts or enchantments that cheaply for like early play consideration, as opposed to needing to be able to destroy them mana efficiently because you wanted to cast something else that turn. Like, one of the most problematic early enchantments is probably the um, the Ascension, the White Ascension from uh, original Zendikar block uh, that makes angels if opponents aren't dealt damage. So what it does is it gets a counter every turn that you don't take damage, every opponent's turn that you don't take damage, and then when it has four counters on it, uh, Luminarch Ascension, I believe it's called. And you can spend two mana when it has four counters on it to make a 4-4 angel. That is one of the enchantments that comes down super early in a game of Commander. And all of a sudden, everybody has to pay attention to that player until they are either dead, or the enchantment is, or 
somebody else has come up with something even worse that is going on somehow. Because you will usually get through... You will play that on turn two, and nobody will have anything, and then you will be able to start activating it by turn three. Like, by, by the time... Before your turn four begins, you should be able to start activating it in most games of Commander. Very few decks have... Like, their early play creatures are going to be utility-based, not aggro-based, in almost every scenario. So now they have to use their utility creatures to poke you for damage, and other players have to also have cheap creatures that they can put into play and attack you with in order for that thing to not accumulate counters, and that usually does not happen. Every once in a while you'll run into a play group that will have the aggro builds necessary to stop a Luminarch Ascension, but usually not. So you don't normally need your artifact or enchantment removal to be... Uh, mana, like, super mana efficient, uh, you usually need it to be um, versatile. So, three mana is usually, like, the low end of what you're going to see artifact and enchantment removal at, simply because that's where you're going to access cards like Putrefy, Mortify, Vindicate, um... Maelstrom Pulse, things that can destroy not only artifacts and enchantments, but other permanent types. Um, or that can destroy multiple permanent types the way this one can. Like, Stomp and Howl is not terrible. There are slightly better versions of it. And because of our color combinations, we have much better options. If you're just in green, um, there's a... I think... The Modern Horizons card, the one that you can remove a green card from your hand, lets you exile two artifacts and is, like, two green in one and is an instant. and like Or two artifacts and, like, any combination of two on the artifacts and enchantments, the um, Force of Vigor. So if you have access to that one, that one's much better than this because it has multiple options for you. But if you don't have access to cards like that, Stomp and Howl is a perfectly fine and relatively cheap one, too. Like, nobody is tearing apart binders looking for old copies of Stomp and Howl. So you should be able to get it at, like, you know, 15, 25 cents, whatever. Whatever your local gaming store is charging for uncommons if they have one in stock. Well, we're certainly getting a lot more content, both for our deck and reasons for me to ramble out of Dissension than I ever thought we were going to. I uh, discard a card at random to deal 2 damage to a creature or player, and 4 damage if it was multicolored. Uh, enchanted creature gets plus 0, plus 2, and can block creatures with land walk. Uh, taste for Mayhem is... Enchanted creature gets plus 2, plus 0 oh for a red, and it jumps to plus 4, plus 0 oh when you're hellbent. Mm, excuse me. Thrive puts a counter on each of X target creatures. Transcale Courier is all colors, so we can't run him. Uh, deals 2 damage to each of 2 target creatures, and when you're hellbent, destroys them. Uh, Unliving Psychopath is an 0-4... Oh Black to give it plus one, minus one, and black tap to destroy a target creature with power less than his power. Uh, no. Choose a color. Enchant. Whenever Enchant Forest is tapped for mana, its controller adds one mana of the chosen color. Uh, tax each turn if able. The green Eidolon is... Oh, right. It's a ritual... Still not anything we're interested in. Uh, tap pay life, add one man of any color. That has blue in its activation. Whenever opponent taps a land for mana, tap all lands that player controls. Whenever a creature an opponent controls attacks, all creatures that opponent controls attack if able. Mildly interesting, but again, when you force an opponent to attack they tend to attack the person that is forcing them to attack unless the effect also diverts it. So, if they're not getting goaded, 
this has been my play experience, is that if you force a player to attack, and they really didn't want to, they will attack you in retribution for forcing them to attack. The nice thing about this, though, is that it's not optional, so it also forces the opponent to tap out on their turns. Like, when they tap a land for mana, they have to tap all of their lands. So, not necessarily forcing them to, like, add mana, just forcing them to tap all of their lands. So they can't leave mana untapped if they want to cast a spell. It's an annoying card. Uh, it means that spells that don't have a lot of reactionary cards and it also means that if they react on a different opponent's turn it taps all of their lands too like counterspell decks if they go to counterspell somebody else's problematic spell it will tap all of their lands on that player's turn and if you are in between that player and the counterspell heavy deck that means you have free reign uh for War's Toil, though, we have to have we have to have a bigger creature than any of the creatures they have that weren't ours to begin with, since those will be goaded when we give them out. Um, it's an interesting card, and kind of interacts with our deck. I'm going to add it to the list. This is one of those weird cards that will make it onto the list because of how it interacts with the other things, but then might not make the deck because it's not doing enough of what... We, you know, it's tangential, but not directly focused on what we're doing. So it's Ren 3. It's an enchant. Uh, whenever an opponent, an OP, taps land... For mana, tap all that player's lands. When an OP attacks, all that player's base are belong to us. Who's attack if able? Fire seals damage to target creature equal the number of non basic lands that creature's controller controls. No. Uh, Whiptail Mollet comes into play, it deals three damage to target creature. Oh, but because it's a three toughness creature, they can always just choose the Whiptail Mollet, right? It's not another creature. Yeah. So it's designed so that if you play it on an empty board, you still have to sacrifice your creature. And there's Wrecking Ball. Alright, we actually found a bunch of interesting cards for this, and I am genuinely pleasantly surprised. No thank you to your cookies, wizards. Alright, so that was Dissension. Now we head to Dominaria. Pulse's top three cards reveal a creature or land, and the rest on the bottom. Uh, is Steer Glider. Uh, 06 creature that can gain indestructible. And target creature you control if it's legendary, then it fights target creature and opponent controls. Not interested. Means reach until end of turn. 4-4 four, four with kicker. Black Blade we don't care about. Bells and Locks Blessing is plus two plus one and gains lifelink if it's legendary. We cast a spell. If that spell was kicked, this gets plus one plus one in Menace. Uh, candle is nothing we're interested in. Destroy target artifact or enchantment. You may put a land from your hand onto the battlefield. Cabal Evangel, Cabal Paladin. Stronghold, Skin Witch, Cast Down. Uh, Torment deals 2 damage to each opponent, and you gain 2 life, and then you lose half your life and make an XX Horror. <clears throat> uh, 
plus two plus two for each R and equipment attached to it. Uh, Chandra has plus one add red red and deal two damage to target player. Minus three deals three damage to target creature or planeswalker. And minus seven deals ten damage to target player and each creature and planeswalker they control. This was an interesting time because you'll notice that there's not another Chandra above or below her, even though this is a Chandra that you can that comes from the Planeswalker deck. This was where they started, I believe, doing Planeswalkers that were in the story, but didn't get a card in the set as Planeswalkers that you could only get in the Planeswalker decks. Which is something I had thought they were doing with um, uh, the blue-white Planeswalker, the Vettelkin from uh, Chandra's home plane. Uh, his name's gone completely out of my head. Uh, when they first announced him, they, preview they previewed his uh, Planeswalker deck card, and I thought what they were doing was giving us Planeswalkers that were relevant to the story but weren't getting a card in the set, and then he wound up getting... Uh, uh, Dovenbon. Dovenbon wound up getting his own card in the regular deck, in the regular set, and in the Planeswalker decks. And I was like, okay. But I think this is one of the few times where they did that, where Chandra was relevant to the story, but did not get a card in the set, because they were focusing more on uh, Liliana and Belzenlock at the time. Who is not a planeswalker, but it was the fight between Liliana and Belzenlock was like the focal point of the set, so. And they didn't have room to put a Chandra planeswalker in the set, but they decided to make a Chandra planeswalker, you know, planeswalker deck for her. Instead of focusing on one of the characters that did get a card in this set. Alright, so this Daragaz is a 7 mana, 7-7 seven, seven flying haste trample. If it dies, it gets exiled as an egg with three counters on it, and the beginning of your upkeep, you remove a egg counter from it, and then if there are no egg counters on it, he comes right back into play. So, potent card, but has absolutely nothing to do with what we are trying to accomplish. And not a particularly... A uh, powerful card in Commander, like, because he does have to die in order to get the eggs on him, and Commander definitely has lots of exile effects. It is a replacement effect, though, so notably he does dodge uh, Graveyard Hate, as he can put himself into exile if he's just killed, or if you can sacrifice him in response to like a Swords to Plowshares or Path to Exile or any of those type of effects. So you can save him that way and you can force your opponent to actually have other answers to him. Uh, we're not running Dark Bargain. Uh, that lets you look at the top two cards of your library um, or top three cards, put two in your hand and the other in your graveyard and then take two damage. Sorry, I was thinking of the ones that let you surveil without saying surveil, and then draw two cards. This one is just top three, two to hand, one to graveyard, lose two life. Uh, dies, you get a 1-1. One, one. Uh, when enchanted creature dies, return that card to owner's hand. Uh, when Bells and Lock and oh, alright, he's legendary, so we can't force him on opponents either, which is kind of sad, because... Belzenlock is able to randomly kill people if they don't hit land. I believe he even has a non-land clause, right? So, yeah, they have to hit cheap spells in order for him to stop. And so, if he reveals enough non-land cards, he can just randomly kill someone. Because he's not optional, they have to keep adding cards. But he is legendary as part of the cycle of Liliana's demons, so we can't just go giving him out. And Divest is not what we want. Shade is part of a cycle of 
monochromatic creatures that have very intense color casting costs. I believe because this set lined up with the Theros Beyond Death, where we were going back to Theros and we're going to have Devotion again, so we wanted plants for that set. Uh, tap add green, or tap add two green if we're kicking things, which this deck is not doing. 5-5 five, five Death Touch. Uh, deals five damage. I will say that large Death Touch creatures have more value in this deck than they would in any other deck. Normally the problem with a large Death Touch creature is that it will kill anything anyway just by being a big dumb creature. But in Commander, you will have much larger creatures than 5-5, five, five, and if they're not indestructible, attacking an opponent with a 5-5 five, five Death Touch means that that thing has to get blocked eventually. Like, if you can keep putting that thing into play under other players' control and forcing it to attack opponents, like, they have to eventually block it. You can't just... that's one-eighth of your life total going away every time this thing connects. So, only the most dedicated life gain decks can shrug that one off. So, it does put pressure on the opponents to keep coming up with blockers. Or, and if they are not chump blockers, like, they can't have a 6-6 to just block it. Like, they either have to chump block it, or they have to trade with it, and then we get it back again. So, larger death touch creatures are not as inherently bad in this build as they would be in other decks, but we still need like a really good death touch creature. We don't just want like it's a 5-5 death touch for 6 mana. We want something that is uh, threatening the opponent with like some other drawback too if they either don't block it or if they chump block it or something like that. We want like an actual threat Uh, Final Parting lets us search for two cards, one to our hand and one to our graveyard. I'm going to add that to the list because we do want to guarantee we get... I'm going to go to Dominaria. There we go. We do want to guarantee that we put our best things to reanimate uh, into our graveyard. This is three black black sorcery. Search our deck. Our deck. My deck. Sorry. Search my deck for two cards. Put one in graveyard, other in hand. Okay. So yeah, like, we're definitely going to include Entomb and um, Buried Alive, but this one also lets us get a card into our hand while putting one of the more important cards into the graveyard, so it's definitely on the short list for tutor effects that we are going to be running. It might still get edged out just for the more... Um, generally potent ones, Demonic Tutor of course, since it's so much cheaper for example but the ability to put one of the cards in the graveyard and the requirement of putting one of the cards in the graveyard means that we can always get one of our things where we want it specifically so that is very useful uh, return to your hand all creatures creature cards and graveyards that were put there from anywhere this turn. Not really. Sorry. We did skip over a few green cards. Fungal Plots lets us exile creature cards from our graveyard, which we don't want to do because we're using them as a resource. Uh, Guy's Blessing shuffles cards back in. Uh, the 4-2 must be blocked, but it only has to be blocked by one creature, as opposed to the lore creatures that we have. Um... If he was a lore creature, if everything had to block him, and we were almost definitely going to force our opponents to block it with something they didn't want to and have it die. Although, the other opponent, if they have enough stuff, 
the other the attacking opponent can always be nice to them and assign combat damage to things that wouldn't die. You know, just assign like one point of damage to an X2 and so on until all four points of damage are divided up among two or more toughness creatures. If they didn't want to make enemies... Uh, we're, I keep scrolling past these. This is the kicker one that rebuys an instant or sorcery, so we don't need that. We have another wizard. This deals two damage. If we have instants and sorceries in the graveyard, this gets plus one, plus oh, and haste. So none of those are anything we're really looking for. Um, untaps the creature, gives it plus two, plus two, and if it's kicked, it's plus four, plus four. Guild Lotus we will consider when we get to Mirrodin. Uh, goblin Barrage, sacrifice a goblin, this spell deals 4 damage to target creature. Uh, if it was kicked, it deals 4 damage to target player or planeswalker. Also, uh, there's Chain Whirler, who is the red one, and the most successful, I believe, out of the uh, three color spell, like three of a specific color spell. Uh, War Chief Reprint, Grand Warlord Rada. Uh, whenever one or more creatures you control, whenever one or more creatures you control, oh, there we go, attack. I was like, wait, where did I miss the attack, the word attack on there? Add that much mana in any combination of red and green, and you don't lose it as phases end and choose a 3-4 haste. So she's an aggressive ramp creature, but that's not really what we need. This is the bad, um, Harrow, I think? Oh, no. Search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle... Oh, yeah, it is a bad harrow, right? Well, not a bad harrow, it's a bad, um... There, there are cheaper spells than this that will let you get two lands from your deck into play for, like, green and three instead of green and four... But this one has... Because it has Kicker, you can cast it at green and two to make it a bad uh, Untamed Wilds. Uh, Grun the Lonely King... I mean, in theory, he's got 20 power, but... A, we won't be able to kick him. Although the bright side to him is that if they attack with him, he attacks as a 10 power creature. If they don't want to attack with any of their other stuff. So, by giving him to other players, he, but again, he does not have any evasion ability, so we would have to be able to make him unblockable with our other cards, or make him difficult to block, and I still haven't found a card that I really want to use where we're giving out, like, Trample. There have got to be a couple cards, though, that we'll run into eventually to give Trample to these giant creatures, and... We are planning on running Rogue's Passage and possibly some other things to make them unblockable. <sighs> also, if we know he he's attacking alone because they have to declare all their attackers simultaneously, with his trigger on the stack, if anybody pumps him, that pump will get doubled. I don't know if that's going to be relevant in what we're running... The one thing I like about Grun is that, as I've said, when we force opponents to attack, they usually don't want to, and so they will usually attack, when they have the choice, they will attack us, but when we're making them attack with the creature, they will probably not want to attack with their other stuff for fear of retaliation anyway. So by making them attack with Grun, they are more inclined to hold back their other creatures in case the player that they're being forced to attack uh, decides to counterattack them. Like, instead of attacking us for giving them the creature, they attack that player. If we're in a four-player game and I give player A Grun, and now they have to attack you know, player B or C because they can't attack me, they might be worried that if they go after B, B will attack them 
especially if B has a better attack against them than they have against me, for giving them Grun the Lonely King and making them attack, <clears throat> since they could have just attacked player C instead. So, while we're giving them player A Grun and making them attack, player A is deciding between players B and C which one of them is getting attacked, and that can lead to either player B or C targeting A instead of us for giving them Grun in the first place, because we didn't make them attack B or C specifically, we made them attack the one of them, and they chose that one type of deal, so they might hold back creatures anyway, and then now Grun's a 10 power creature. Of course, if we interfere then and give Grun, you know, unblockability or trample or something, that makes them more inclined to attack us over player A, but it's just something to consider as I talk myself. I'm already writing down Grun as though I might not, and I'm trying to justify him now as though I wasn't going to add him to the short list. We cannot give out Grun because Grun is legendary. <sighs> Grun is legendary. We can't give out legendary creatures. Moving on. Everything I said about Grun is true for other large threatening creatures like that and is a factor when determining what we're going to... The fact that Grun has to attack alone to get his bonus is why I was going so in-depth over it. But Grun is legendary, and the Beamtown Bullies will not put legendaries into play. None of these are particularly impressive. This is fun for a group hug type thing. Since we are giving this to a player and forcing them to attack, it is actually a functional howling mine. I don't know, again, that we want to be that friendly. Giving one player a card is definitely okay, especially if we let them loot or um, rummage for it instead of actually giving them card advantage. Letting everybody draw a card is a little too helpful for this deck. Oh, right, this was... We got a Jaya Planeswalker for the first time in this set, and because of that, that's why Chandra, while being relevant to the set, did not get her own Planeswalker card. Jaya is very spell-focused, though. She does let us discard up to three cards to draw that main card. She is five mana, though. That is a very okay ability. If we had, if we cared more about instants and sorceries going to the graveyard and not creatures, Jaya would definitely make the shortlist for this deck. But she doesn't, so we're not going to. Or we don't, so she's not going to make it into the deck. Um, yeah, we don't care about historic as much because we don't want too many legendaries in the deck since we can't give them out, despite my desire to throw a legendary creature in there and then start handing it out. <sighs> Karn Scion. Uh, when Carplusion Carpo Hound attacks, you control a Chandra Planeswalker. This creature deals two damage to any target. No. Karlov is legendary. Uh, it won't be kicked when we give it out. Huh. Similar to the, um, the creature from, uh, not a mon Oh no, it is a monkette. So, similar to the creature from a monkette, the jackal warrior that could exert itself to rummage... Uh, Keldon Raider is not a bad card to give out. In fact, it has a better body. Although we can't cast it cheaply ourselves and start rummaging right away. But it's still probably 
worth considering as a friendly card that is also a four power creature that we're sending out to go deal damage. It is optional, so they don't have to rummage away if they don't want to, but it's certainly something that a lot of players would not mind having the option to do. So it's a 4 3. <clears throat> ETBs. I rummage. Like, the, the smaller one allows us to cast it earlier and rummage away things sooner so that we can set up the Beamtown Bullies. The Raider comes down around the same time the Bullies would. Uh, doesn't need to attack, though, lets us rummage, and is a better thing to give away to other players <clears throat> to let them rummage with if we're being friendly about things. That one speeds up sagas. Uh, doesn't super matter. Only has only gains life with the kicker, I believe. Yeah. Uh, we can't give this out because it's an enchantment and legendary. And yeah. You can't lose the game until it leaves play, and life gain lets you draw cards. Life loss makes you uh, exile permanents you control or cards from your hand or graveyard, and eventually, if this leaves play, you lose the game. <clears throat> so it turns your life total into what you have available, cards in hand, cards in play, cards in graveyard. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, when you cast a historic spell, you may pay black to return from your graveyard to your hand. Good old Lalamore Elves, and Lalamore Envoy fixes mana, Scout lets you put lands from your hand into play, Mammoth Spider is Giant Spider with a little bit of an upgrade for an extra mana. I guess it's plus one plus one for one extra man. So, uh, another Elf enters the battlefield under your control, put a counter on her and she adds green equal to her power. So, no. I don't think we need the memorials. Uh, self replicator can let you make copies of it. So, that doesn't do anything for our deck. Voltani is legendary. Uh, he does come back from the graveyard. And he's a large trampling creature for us, but I don't think we need him specifically. Returns a permanent card. Sack an artifact to deal two damage. Five five trampler. Seven damage to a flyer. Seven six no abilities. Three one haste. Three damage to a player and one damage to their creatures. Uh, gets worse when it gets blocked. Have any number of rat colonies. Uh, plus three, plus three, and trample. Yeah, we can do better than run amok as our surprise trampling effect in this deck. So we're not even going to consider it. Uh, <clears throat> nope. Uh, if a source would deal damage to a equipped creature, prevent two of it. No. Shivan Fire, no. Short Sword. Siege Gang Commander, no. Uh, add a red. Skittering Surveyor. Honestly, if we were going to give out Skittering Surveyor, I'd rather give out Pilgrim's Eye, since it's more likely to get through for damage. If we're going to go that route and be friendly. Slime Foot, Song of Fraley's, Sorcerer's Wand, Soul Salvage, Sparring Construct, yeah, none of these are particularly impressive. Ah, there's the triple green one. Uh, He's a kicker card, so he won't do his thing. That's not going to be it. 
Hmm. Yeah, that's not particularly impressive. He needs to be kicked to fight things. Sacrifice outlets. Don't really care for the Eldest Reborn in this deck. Or the Mending. Mending's gonna shuffle... or er, Then shuffle your graveyard into your library. Yeah, we don't want that. Uh, so the attacking player, so Thorn Elemental is a reprint. Thorn Elemental is originally from Urza's Destiny, and there are a couple of similar cards to him. Thorn Elemental allows the attacker to choose if they want to deal the damage. If Thorn Elemental just automatically dealt its damage to the defending player, we would include that, because at that point it's essentially 7 power unblockable that is hitting the opponent even if the other opponent didn't want it to. Um, but since it does not work that way, I have a couple legendary creatures that we can't use because they're not doing what we want them to anyway. Yeah, you have to... If he let you discard creature cards to get mana, maybe? Because setting a player's life total... What does it become? Half their starting life total? So setting a player to 20 is an okay effect to have with all the giant life swings we're potentially threatening to have happen during these games. Mm, yeah. Nope. Verdant Force is just a 7-7 seven, seven with the way the decks work. Uh, when you attack with three or more creatures, you may pay red and two, return to the battlefield, tapped and attacking. No. No, no. A plus one, plus one counter. Each creature you control, if it was kicked, you do two instead. Enter the battlefield, put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard, and gain three life. If we had more value for opponents being forced to mill themselves, maybe we could include a card like that. Ah, uh, good old Yargol. Shepherd, enter the battlefield, get a one one green creature. Offering, Ooh, excuse me, adds Alfred Void. All right, so very little from Dominaria. So expansion, the O Dominaria, Double Masters, Dragon's Maze. Uh, one of the least impactful worst sets in probably all of modern magic would I think maybe Born of the Gods might be able to fight it for that spot but wow was Dragon's Maze terrible it does have a couple of fun cards in it but most of them have been reprinted to death as things in like other magic sets for when they need like rares they can pull cause nobody wants to open Dragon's Maze even with the shock lands in it, there's very rarely enough to make it worthwhile. Armed and dangerous. Tire creature gets plus one, plus one, and gains double strike. Would be great if it weren't a sorcery. Uh, all creatures able to block target creature this turn do so. Also a sorcery, so we will not be able to use that to our advantage. Uh, Monocolored creatures can't block this turn. At sorcery speed doesn't help. He's a 1-3, so nobody cares. 2-1 Trample Evolve, no. Uh, flesh and Blood. Exile target creature card from a graveyard. Put X plus 1 plus 1 counters on target creature, where X is the power of the card you exiled. And then Blood is target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to target creature or player. So we do have a large... We do have lots of large creatures that we are trying to put into the graveyard that we could put counters on like the Beamtown bullies with I always use the bullies because as our commander and as the focal point of what we are trying to accomplish we will almost always be casting the bullies on turn 4 if we are able 
and then replaying them on subsequent turns if things go, you know, wrong for them. Like, the bullies are the focal point of the deck and how it plans to win, so we are always going to try and have them in play at every opportunity. So, yes, we can put these counters on any of our other creatures that we are planning on using for our own purposes, like to set up the cards in the graveyard, so that way we can give them out. Um, I have to believe, though, that we would rather just have our giant creatures in the graveyard to be given away, as opposed to using them as a resource to buff up our one creature that we actually have. Yeah. Carnage Gladiator is okay. It's the it falls into the same pitfall of if we give it to an opponent and they only attack with this, and the defending player blocks with like a five five, they lost one life, and that basically did nothing. It's also an okay creature for us to have, like, for us to have in play while we are making other players attack with other things, such that at least we're dealing, we're causing the defending player to lose a life every time they block, even if we're not um, getting through for damage, and if the things that we're giving to them, we really want them to go unblocked or to trample over you know, get damage in against the other players, though. More so, Like, this just doesn't feel impactful enough. Similar to that one Dragon Spirit that when they attack with a goaded creature, they lose a life. Just doesn't seem like it's doing nearly enough. All cards from target player's graveyard and gain three life for each card? No. Uh, when Dead Bridge Chant enters the battlefield, put the top ten cards of your library into your graveyard. At the beginning of your upkeep, choose a card at random in your graveyard. If it's a creature, put it onto the battlefield. No. No, 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 no. I could not remember, like, what the actual benefit... I knew it milled a bunch of cards. I couldn't remember what the actual benefit was going to be. And, yeah, we do not want to randomly put one of our terrible creatures into play. That is actually awful down, target player discards two cards, dirty, return target card from your graveyard to your hand. Yeah, o overpriced, uh, and then you can pay the total mana between the two of them to cast both simultaneously. But yeah, overcosted mind rot and overcosted regrowth, and insanely overcosted both of them at seven mana. Not where we want to be. Creature gets minus one, minus one for each land card put in your graveyard that way. No. First strike, haste, unleash. Each other creature with a counter on it has haste. That I control. Nope. Uh, minus four, minus two. No. Three, Feral Amos gets plus X plus zero until end of turn where X is his power. He doesn't have trample... And we're not forcing the opponent to activate him either. There's the flesh, half of flesh and blood. Gaze of Granis, destroy each non-land permanent with converted mana cost X or less. Certainly an okay board wipe to include in the deck. It is on the expensive side though, and we're not really ramping all that hard so far. And when we are ramping... Uh, I've selected primarily artifact sources, which will, you know, get killed by the Gaze of Granite also. So probably not. Uh, I don't think we need the Clue Stones. Uh, War Chant. Each attacking creature you control gets plus one, plus zero, and can't be blocked except by two or more creatures. Uh, target player loses two life, then reveals a card at random from their hand. Death touch, and two, remove a plus one, plus one counter from a creature you control to give minus one, minus one until end of turn. Six mana buff. 
Master of Cruelties uh, can only attack alone, so if we put him into play, they get a first strike death touch, and when it deals combat damage, so yeah, Master of Cruelties, definitely the type of thing we want to give out. Dragon's Maze. So, Master of Cruelties is... Three black red for a one four demon as first strike death touch can only attack alone. Only attack alone when this attacks and isn't blocked. It deals no damage and the defender's life becomes one. And, uh, definitely something for the more, um, for the more, uh, streamlined version of this deck where we don't care if we're making friends with other people. We just want to give people terrible things. Like, this one we are not punishing the player we're giving it to, except that we're not letting them attack with anything else because Master of Cruelties must attack if able, and he cannot attack attack unless he attacks alone, so it stops them from attacking with any of their other creatures against any other player when we give them the master. So, but we are allowing them to choose from among our other opponents which one they will send this thing at. And it's very likely for this thing to get blocked and killed in combat because... Letting it go unblocked is actually actively terrible for the defending player. So very easy for it to get in there and kill an opponent's creature and probably die in the process unless they have like a bunch of 1-1 tokens lying around to throw in front of it. Hmm. Plus five, plus five is a sorcery. No. Two, seven, no. No. Petrify reprint. Hmm. If Blood Rush. If there's a Blood Rush creature that gives trample, we might consider it as we can give an attacking creature a sudden power boost and trample, allowing them to, you know, trample over the defending player. Like, if they were trying to be nice and attacking an opponent that had a bunch of 1-1s, and it's like, okay, and I block with the 1-1, and your big dumb thing gets exiled in the end of turn, and we can go, no, we're going to give this trample. If we could find a thing that has either a very cheap um, blood rush cost, or a very high power, where we can turn the creature lethal. I forget, I know there's like one that's like that, but I think it's, uh, Blood Rush cost is very high, it's like, uh, like a dead bridge creature, not Goliath, I don't think. It might be somewhere hiding in here, like in this set, as opposed to the other Return to Ravnica sets. Mm, yeah, no. None of these are particularly impressive. Ah, right, we can't give out Rorkthar. I was about to muse about how giving Rorkthar to a player 
that has a lot of instants and sorceries in their deck, but again, he's legendary. I do have a Rorik Thar deck, and is obviously very creature-centric, since that's why I built him, is to put a lot of creatures into play, large creatures, and punish opponents for casting spells to get rid of them, as opposed to fighting me on my terms with giant creature versus giant creature. I uh, can't really give that out. If we could consistently prevent this from trying to murder the Beamtown bullies, the fact that the opponent doesn't get to control what it fights, that it just randomly attacks something, um, that might be interesting, but we don't want it to kill the bullies, so we have to consistently get them out of range, or get them uh, protected, hexproof, or shroud. And while we are certainly, or indestructible, and while we are certainly going to run cards that do that, I don't know if we can do it consistently enough that we would want the uh, Scab Clan Giant in our deck. Alright, creature and opponent controls. Nope. I, I did always find this card, like, very darkly amusing, especially the... Uh, flavor text on it. <laughs> and enchanted creature attacks or blocks its control, loses seven life. Hmm. Sire of Insanity. The beginning of each end step, so he would be in play to trigger for this. And he makes everybody discard their hand, and we do get to decide when we give this out. It might be worth considering, there might be better options, but we'll add them to the list. He is four black red, he is a demon. Is a six four. Beginning of end step. Everyone discards their hand. All right. We'll add them to the list. Might not make it. We might get better options for just making opponents discard their hands, but he's certainly a card that when we're winning, uh, taking away all of the opponent's options to interact with our combo seems like a good idea. And then once he's gone, um, then from that player's end step onward, we'll start accumulating cards again. Toil and Trouble. Target player draws two cards and loses two life. Trouble deals damage to target player equal to the number of cards in that player's hand. So, no. This is the guy that requires gates. Uh, this gives your dead creature scavenge. Oh, he's also legendary. He is the troll. He is the representative. So, Dragon's Maze, storyline-wise, every, um, guild has their maze runner. And Verilos is the, um, Golgari maze runner. Uh, weapon surge, target creature, you control gets first strike and then overload, so not what we're interested in. This guy doubles mana production and is terrifying to give away. And Zertod Druid taps for green and whenever he becomes tapped he deals a damage to each opponent. So, oh right, uh, the Blood Witch was the maze runner for Rakdos. I was going to say, we saw uh, Rorik Thar and then the scar-striped troll. I could not remember who the maze runner was for Rakdos, but it was the Blood Witch. 
Alright, so that takes care of Dragon's Maze. Now on to Dragons of Tarkir. Uh, Acid Speed Dragon is turned face up. No. Uh, Megamorph and Reach. No. Uh, has reach as long as it has a counter. Turn face up to destroy. Uh, whenever Ambuscade, Shaman, or another creature enters the battlefield under your control, that creature gets plus two, plus two. So amusingly, because we are giving him out, he will be a 4-4 four, four haste. That would pump the player's other things. Uh, ancestral Statue enters the battlefield, return a non-land permanent you control to its owner's hand, so they would just give us Ancestral Statue back if they didn't want to bounce their own stuff. Uh, each creature you control assigns combat damage equal to its toughness. No. Beast Breaker, you can spend 5 mana to give it plus 4, plus 4. Only if you control... This is the one where you have to control 8 or more. Yeah, there's two different mechanics that are very similar. Like, there's the Temer mechanic is ferocious, and you have to have a four-power creature. And then there's Formidable, where you have to have eight total power worth of creatures. Uh, turn face up, deals one damage. Tarka's Monument. Pummeler is a four-five. Uh, you have to have Formidable to activate it. And each creature you control can't be blocked this turn, except by two or more. Oh, so it gives Intimidate. Uh, Tarka's Command, we're probably not doing gain life. Opponents can't gain life this turn. Command deals 3 damage to each opponent. Put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield, and creatures you control get plus 1, plus 1, and reach until end of turn. It's a very potent card, but it's not doing anything that we're trying to accomplish, so we continue onwards. Uh, yeah, our attacking creatures having double strike is not helping much. 3 mana, 3, 2 reach, enters the battlefield with a plus 1, plus 1 counter on it for each creature you control with a plus 1, plus 1 counter on it. Would be kind of funny to give to the counters matter decks and give them this creature that will come into play with a plus 1, plus 1 counter for basically each creature they control and then be forced to attack the opponents with trample. Um, so that's okay, but not amazing. Sacrifice another warrior target player loses X life, and you gain X life, where X is the sacrifice warrior's power. Uh, attacks each warrior you control can't be blocked, except by two or more. When another creature enters the battlefield under your control, target creature gets plus two, plus zero until end of turn. Uh, two, four, vigilance, taps for three mana if you have eight or more power. So you plus O and lifelink and regenerate it. No. Plus one, plus two, and death touch. No. Collected company, no. Two, four, no. Exile the top X cards of your library until the end of your next turn. You may play those cards. Uh, five, one, hexproof. That's an enchantment. Sacrifice one or more creature card, or exile one or more, yeah. Exile one or more creature cards from your graveyard, so no. I thought it said sacrifice at first, so I was going to read it to see what we could sacrifice them to do, but no. You have 8 power, he can become an 8 power, and you can sacrifice him to deal 4 damage to target creature. Defender and enters tapped, so that's no to both of those. X minus X. And it's a battlefield if you cast it from your hand, so no. Uh, that's the Megamorph that we can get back, but I don't think we need to. Power two or less. Turns face up to buy back a card. Destroy any number of target creatures. For each creature destroyed this way, its controller puts a 4-4 red dragon with flying into play. Uh, destroy target blue or black non-creature permanent. Permanent you control can't be the target blue or black spells. 
Uh, you may reveal a dragon or control a dragon, deals 3 damage to target creature, and if you did 3 damage to the controller, make some goblins, Who cares when dragons enter play, uh, gains flying, plus 1, plus 0, oh, and formidable makes a 4-4 four, four dragon token. Uh, we can't force a Tarka into play. Or Dragon Lord Colagon, and I don't think we want to run them for ourselves either. Red, green, and black, green, yeah, and there's not going to be a. Or red, green, and uh, black, red, and there's not going to be a red, green dragon. Uh, 3 2, and can regenerate if you have 8 or more power. Ulster 4. Uh, dies, return a creature card from your graveyard to your hand, plus one, plus two, and fight. Uh, explosive vegetation, two basic lands, and put them into play tapped. Minus four, minus four. Foe Razor region enters the battlefield. You may have it fight target creature you don't control. Whenever a creature you control fights, Put two plus one plus one counters on it at the beginning of the next end step. So not only do we not have control over who they fight, uh, it also doesn't get the counters until the end of turn, so it doesn't get to add to its power for attacking the player. From your graveyard to your hand, target creature gets minus X, minus X, where X is the toughness of the card return this way. No, probably not. So one where you, they sack a creature, uh, target opponent loses one life for each attacking creature you control, you gain that much life. Nope. We attack, oh, it's an equipment only new creature with toughness four or less, or four or more, rather. Yes, only four or less can wield this giant gate-smashing battering ram equipment. Uh, can attack... Uh, any number of creature cards from your graveyard on top of your library and draw a card. Uh, Megamorph. Death Touch. No. Uh, red 1 deals 1 damage to each creature without flying. Green and 2 deals 1 damage to each other creature with flying. Not helping much. Uh, text. Next spell you cast is 1 less. Trove enters the battlefield, exile all cards from target opponent's graveyard. You may play lands, exile with it, and you may cast a non-land card, exile with it. You can't cast more than one spell this way each turn. Uh, Herd Chaser is the green Megamorph one. Impact Tremors. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, deals one damage, so not helping since we're putting creatures into play under opponent's control half the time. Our Shaman is the red Megamorph dude. That lets us look at face down cards. Esperant becomes blocked by a creature. Deals one damage to that creature. Doesn't super matter. Uh, star 3 is equal to the number of creatures you control. 2-2 dash, haste and megamorph, Colagon's command is okay, uh, kills little creatures, destroys artifacts, um, can dome the opponent for two, alright, it does let you get a creature card, I could not remember, I knew the artifact and the make them discard and the two damage, I forgot that the other mode is return a creature card from your graveyard to your hand, it's been so long since I've actually cast a Colgon's command in anything, um, fire breathing, haste creature, uh, lose calm, uh, gains haste until end of turn, oh, and gains menace. Uh, formidable forces of the block. Magmatic chasm. Creatures without flying can't block this turn. Generate megamorph. Mind rot. Uh, exploit. When it exploits a creature, creatures your opponent's control get minus one, minus one until end of turn. 
So, exploit creatures, if we give them out, the opponent who gets them just gets to use them as a spell because they can ex sacrifice the creature to itself if they want to. So, if we're looking at any exploit creatures, we should look at them as though we're going to be giving the opponent the spell effect that they get when they exploit a creature. are going to make it into the deck. Four damage to target white or blue creature. Prevent all combat damage. You may look at face down cards. He can't block. Other zombies get plus one, plus one, and he can be cast from the graveyard, but he costs more based on the number of dead things you have. Five damage to target creature without flying. Uh, trample and first strike if you have eight or more power. Uh, whenever another permanent you control is turned face up, if it's a creature, put two plus one plus one counters on it, and it has Megamorph. Uh, Quartermaster enters the battlefield with two counters on it. Green and two, remove a counter from it. Put a counter on a target creature. Five mana, two, two. Already doesn't look great. ETB's bolster, two. Uh, Rage deals five damage to a creature or player. If you control a dragon, if you don't, wait, if you control no dragons, okay, deals two damage to you. Uh, triumph, search for a dragon, reveal it, and put it into your hand, shuffle your library. There's Savage Vent Maw again, who gives out way too much mana for me to feel comfortable. Uh, you can reveal a dragon, uh, enters the battlefield with a plus one, plus one counter on if you revealed a dragon or controlled one. Silence is a 4-4 four, four flyer, colorless. 2-3 with dash, 6-5 with megamorph, 2 damage to each creature without flying. Target opponent sacrifices a green or white creature. If that player does, they lose 2 life. There's a battlefield with a counter on it. When it dies, put X counters on target creature you control, where X is the number of counters that were on it. There's the Biorhythm Shaman. That requires Formidable to do the Biorhythm effect. And also taps for 2 mana. Uh, when it dies, target creature and opponent controls gets minus 1, minus 1. Sheltered Ari enters the battlefield. Each player discards a card. Sadisi is the tutor. Also, we can't give Sadisi out. Uh, he's difficult to block. Beginning of combat on your turn. Creatures you control with toughness 4 or greater get plus 2, plus 2, and gain vigilance. Uh, butcher is you can exploit a creature. Target creature gets minus 3, minus 3 until end of turn. Alright, so that one can't naturally kill the bullies by itself. Mm, excuse me. <sighs> Just stretching. Um... So if we give it out, they will almost definitely sacrifice it to its own ability if they want to kill something else on the board. But that's fine. Ah, went straight to Dragons of Tarkir. Silumgar <laughs> Butcher. Is four and a black. It's a three-three zombie Jin. I forgot the Jins. Like they mostly show up as um, just guy creatures, so I kind of forget about them when thinking about these sets when I'm not looking at just guy cards. Three-three uh, zombie Jin. Uh, it has exploit. And when it does, so it has exploit to give a creature minus three, minus three. Creature minus, oops, minus three, minus three until EOT. So yeah, we can give that away. They can't, you know, backstab us to kill 
be uh, Beamtown Bullies, even if we don't have a way to protect them without another effect. So, it's just a big dude. Uh, gains Trample. 5-5 five, five, Trample and Megamorph. Uh, that's the Red Megamorph Dragon. That's just a 4-3. Bolster X, where X is the number of cards in your hand. And gives out Trample. Can't give him away. Uh, enters the battlefield. You may put a creature card with converted mana cost 3 or less from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield. It gains haste. Return it to your hand at the beginning of the next end step. Not anything I'm super interested in doing. Uh, three or less means it's usually going to give them back a utility creature or, like, a creature that can draw them a card. You know, something along those lines, a mana dork, something. Not anything too terrifying. Unless, of course, it has, like, low printed power. But... Although it does, ha it goes into play and does have to return to their hand, so it does have to, they can't return, like, a Hydra or something from their graveyard to play unless something else is buffing it up, or it naturally has, like, one or two power before you start adding in X. Uh, Thunderbreak region is the one that deals damage when they try and target it, or other dragons. Uh, target creature gets plus two, plus two, and trample... Uh, Twin Bolt deals 2 damage divided. That's a 2-5 Death Touch. Uh, Virulent Plague hits creature tokens. We don't care. Uh, attacking creatures get plus 2, plus 0, and trample until end of turn. Note, this is one of the ones that does not say your creatures. So, it does not matter who is attacking. Only... Or it only cares about who is attacking. So... If your opponent attacks with one of your terrifying creatures, this will give it plus 2, plus 0, oh, and trample. If they attack with their other stuff, too, they're less inclined to attack with their other stuff when we're forcing them to attack. We can throw this around, though, as just a thing that we do when one player decides to kill another player, if we don't mind them getting taken out that way or we want their stuff to die based on how they're blocking. As long as we can survive whatever is attacking us suddenly getting plus two, plus oh, and trample in these situations. Hey. Right. This will probably wind up not making the cut, but... I think there are better versions of this out there, but this is one of the ones that does it based on who's attacking, not necessarily, you know, having to be our creatures in combat. So attacking creatures get plus two, plus zero, and trample until end of turn. Uh, returns an insert sorcery card from our graveyard and then deals damage based on that spell CMC to each creature your opponents control not what we're doing similarly to how we did not want to give out the Phyrexian that draws to and loses to I am even less inclined to give out this creature which they don't even have to attack the opponents with after doing that uh, dash cost costs two less. So he's not doing anything, and Zergo is legendary. Alright. Back to... Gather, remove dragons. And go to... Alright, so all the dual decks are reprints, so we can skip over every single one of those. Eighth edition is reprints, so we're going straight to Eldritch Moon. Uh, up to two target creatures get plus one, plus oh, and gain first strike until end of turn, and you can cast it with Madness. Uh, Abolisher is the backside of a different creature. 
when you cast Abundant Maw, so we're never casting Abundant Maw when we're giving it to opponents. So they're just stuck with a 6 4. So I don't think we care. Greeting deals 4 damage to target creature and has madness. Assembled alphas. Blocks or becomes blocked by a creature. It deals 3 damage to that creature and 3 damage to that creature's controller. So it is a 5 5 creature. If it becomes blocked, it's going to deal a grand total of 8 damage unless the blocking creature has a first strike and enough power to bring them down. So. And we'll still wind up dealing 3 damage to that creature anyway before combat damage is dealt. And it deals 3 damage to the opponent that blocks it. So, either the opponent is taking 5 and not blocking it, or the opponent is blocking it and taking 3 and losing what they're blocking with in most cases. Uh, this seems like a card that we will entertain at least. So, oops, we did not spell Eldritch right. There we go. So, assembled alphas is five and a red. The biggest strike against this thing is the biggest strike against a lot of these creatures is that they cost five to seven mana. So, we're not doing anything early, and we need early plays to not get run over. Oh, I'm already starting to type in their game text. They are red and five for... A 5-5 five, five wolf. Whenever this is blocked, it deals 3 damage to the defending player and the blocking creature. Oh, it's also when it become when it blocks. So whenever this blocks or is blocked. So we actually want to do to the creature Coal is the backside of an artifact. Uh, survivalists are 4 3. They get plus 1 plus 1 and trample with delirium. Alright, Bedlam Reveler is. costs 1 less to cast for each instant sorcery in the graveyard, which we're not doing, so that's unlikely. Um, it has prowess, and when it enters the battlefield, discard your hand and draw 3 cards. The fact that we can't discount this card very easily is probably the only reason why I'm not considering adding it to the deck. Giving it to an opponent with a large number of cards in their hand and making them go to three cards is a perfectly fine thing to do. Also being able to discard our bad hands full of things we don't want and drawing three cards is good. Similar to the Chandra I was thinking about before. Uh, if we were going to consistently discount him, he would be so much better. But we are focused very heavily. Like, we will be running some number of instants and sorceries just because we need stuff that... That's true, we're going to be running instants and sorceries to deal with problematic permanents anyway. We can add him to the list, and if we wind up cutting too many instants and sorceries from the deck, then Reveler will become a casualty of those cards going away. I was going to say, Bedlam is definitely a real word. It is six red red for a three four devil horror. Cost one 
plus one less cast for each dead instant and sorcery. It's got prowess, ETB, discard my hand and draw three. Alright, so we'll add him to the list. If we don't get enough stuff, then we'll just cut him. Like, if we... We should have a re... Like, not a large number of instants and sorceries, but we're going to have a bunch of utility instants and sorceries in the deck for destroying artifacts and enchantments and other creatures and whatnot, so... Those are still going to go into the deck, so we will have some number of them to discount them with. It just depends on how many we're running. Like, if we're only running, like, eight instants in the deck and, like, four sorceries, then he's probably not making the cut. We need this thing to cost, like, at least six mana or less out of the eight that he starts off on. Mm. Ah, there's Brazella. Hi, Brazella. Yeah, your constituent parts, though, we can't run, so we have no interest in you. Ooh, certain death, no. Jittering host, we can run, but we're not going to. Since its parts are mono black. Uh, plus one, plus one, and punches target creature you don't control, no. Um, brutality is a discard outlet that lets us get some amount of advantage back from the cards that we're discarding, but we should be able to do better. Speaking of which, this one lets us discard our hand and draw that many cards. Um... When we let's see, it deals three damage to target opponent. Um, discard target player discards their hand and draws that many cards, and four damage to target creature. It is a single target wheel effect that we can use when we start cluttering our hand with spells we don't want, and it does only cost three mana to discard our hand and draw. We're going to add it to the list. So it's one red, red sorcery. Escalate one. Um, see, target. Um, target player discards their hand and draws that many uh, deal four damage to a creature or deal three to an opponent okay Was there not a green collective card? Huh. I'm trying to remember now if there were any blue or white collective cards. Because I'm blanking on what they did off the top of my head. I think there was a white one that had Gideon on it. But now I can't remember if there was a blue one, and there does not seem to be a green one. Uh, whenever kind of Storms attacks, add red. And it doesn't empty until the end of the next main phase. And then you can transform him into Conduit of Emrakul. The end of your upkeep, you may put the top card of your library into your graveyard. Delirium, sacrifice this, return up to one target creature card and one target land card. Uh, target attacking human gets plus one, plus one. 
discard a card to make a zombie, and then you can tap three zombies to draw a card and lose a life. If we had more zombies to begin with, I would use Crypt Breaker as one of the cards that lets us put the um, other cards into our graveyard, since we might be able to draw a card with him faster than having to activate that for three consecutive turns, or at least three consecutive activa activations. Blech because we would be able to untap him with some of the cards that we're also going to use to untap the Beamtown Bullies. And there's a battlefield tapped. Add one man of any color. Each player loses a life, and then that turns into the essence of Emrakul from before. Uh, plus two, plus two. Makes zombies, and then gives minus X, minus X based on the zombies. Uh, when you cast... Decimator gives plus two, plus two, and trample, but we're not, like, the opponent is not casting it, which is probably fine, because now it's just a bit, but then it's just a 7-7 seven, seven trampler, and it's like a 10 mana thing, so that's not really worth it, 2-1 menace, uh, sorcery speed, uh, we can emerge it, or... We can't give it to the opponent to merge, which, again, probably good, since they could target us, but I don't think we care enough to cast it to begin with. Five seven Hexproof isn't anything. Cost two less if it's delirious. Uh, cast it to tap things. Big scary Emrakul. No. 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 Extra caters white on the front. Reaver's just a 2 2. That's only a 2 1. That's a blue card on the other side. Foul Emissary enters the battlefield. Look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal a creature card from among them and put it in your hand. When you sacrifice it to cast an Emerge spell, you get a 3-2. So we're almost never doing that second part. Because there are only a handful of Emerge cards to begin with. And we're not running any of them. So far. 1-2 uh, Trample. Beginning of combat. You may discard a card to give it plus 3 power. Deals X damage where X is 2 plus the number of galvanic bombardments in your graveyard. Another creature you control dies. This gets a counter. Everybody draws and discards. Your creature spells cost one more to cast. Uh, I think there are better inconveniences than this one that we can give out with a similar vein where they make the opponent's spells more expensive while they control Scarecrow, while they control the creature, similar to how Scarecrow works. Uh, becomes a bigger Death Toucher. Zombies, there's Graph Rats. Grapple with the Pass. Grim Flare is a 2-2 Trampler that becomes a 4-4 Trampler with Delirium, and then... When he deals combat damage, you can mill... Like, you can... What is it? Look at the top four? Yeah. Put any number of them into your graveyard and the rest back on top in any order. So, yeah, you can mill selectively from the top of your deck. Anglerfish is blue on the front. He cares about humans. Um, I don't think we care about any version of Handwire. Like, we can't give the land to other players. And I believe they have to both... Like, meld happens only if you control... Only if you own both permanents. <sighs> Harmless Offering was a card I had been thinking about with this deck because it allows us to give away one of our opponent... One of our permanents to an opponent. But most of them are more about... Uh, bad comes into play effects than bad attack triggers. Also, we're not forcing them to attack with them. Ultimately, I think this card goes in another deck entirely. Like, us giving out our stuff 
this way is not what the deck is trying to do, so. Makes a spirit, discard two cards, return it from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Petros Devils is 6 1 Trample Haste. Uh, when it attacks, up to one target creature defending player controls, blocks it this combat if able, and then gets sacrificed at the beginning of the end step anyway. Although our thing to exile it will go on the sack above it, but they have to attack, they have to block. Yeah, no, I'm down. Petros Devils. Seems like a good enough ball lightning. Trueless Devils is two red red for a six one devil. Haste Trample. Uh, do they up to it is up to one target creature defending player control so I guess it's not actually forcing them to block it gives them the ability to force a block up to one creature blocks it if able, so it provokes. Um, huh, I wonder if the, if provoke is not optional, if you have to choose a creature and force it to block. I don't think it is. I think you could choose a creature to untap, so that way you weren't forced to untap something you didn't want to. Set this at EOT. Uh, not running incendiary flow. Attacks each combat if able and has madness. Ishkana is legendary. Hard swarm. Again, is another emerge creature we're not running. That's white on the front. Not running that. Not running Lily. Um, two cards. Put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard, then you may return a creature card from your graveyard to your hand, so no. No, make mischief, no. Uh, Crusader, as haste as long as you control another vampire, no. Midnight scavengers, no. Uh, whenever a player casts a spell, casts an instant sorcery spell that targets only Mirror Wing, that player copies that spell for each other creature he or she controls that spell could target. No. Mockery of Nature, no. Uh, one more well enters the battlefield if there are four more card types in... Your graveyard creatures with power two or less can't block this turn. It's a 3 2 haste, so nope. Good old murder. Discard X cards deals damage equal to the total converted mana cost of the discard cards to each of up to X target creatures and or planeswalkers. Eh, I think we can still do better than that. Like, I'd rather draw some new cards to replace them. Deals combat damage to a creature. That creature becomes a copy of permeating mass. That would be fun if opponents were forced to block. Since they are not forced to block permeating mass, they just take the one and move on with their lives. Like, it's not a particularly good creature. You control a fight start creature you don't control. Dies, you may search for a basic land... Uh, enchant creature has haste and tap discard a card to draw a card. Uh, Tire opponent loses three life and puts a card from their hand on top of their library. No. 
Rise from the grave, ruthless disposal, not making it. Uh, choose one or more. Creature's target player controls gain trample until end of turn, deals two damage to target creature, deals one damage to each creature target opponent controls. Eh. It does give out trample while doing other stuff that might be relevant to us, but at the cost of red and four, most likely, to get the other benefits. Up to one target instant, one target sorcery from your graveyard, then discard a card, exile shreds of sanity, shrill howler, no, sinuous predator, no, discard a card, each player loses two life, no. Smoldering Werewolf deals one damage to each of up to two target creatures and transforms for six. Stag enters the battlefield. You may have it fight target creature you don't control, so no. No. Flash. Spear of the Hunter enters the battlefield. Each other creature you control that's a wolf or werewolf gets plus zero, plus three. Uh, deals six damage. Divide as you choose among any number of target creatures. Uh, destroy target artifact or enchantment gain four. Deals damage equal to the number of vampires you control. Draw a card. Enters the battlefield, top target land and opponent controls, and that land doesn't untap. No. Uh, plus one, plus one, and then gets better with delirium. Discard a card, vampires you control get plus one, plus one, only once per turn. Trample deals combat damage to a player. Exile the top card of your library until end of turn. You can play it. Uh, draw two cards and lose two life. Flash and reach. Two four that can block extra creatures. A defender. Uh, foul bloods. Delirium gets plus one plus one in menace. Tree of Perdition. Exchange target opponent's life total with Tree of Perdition's toughness. So, notably the tree is not legendary, so we can give it out and it does have haste. We aren't forcing a player to use it and they can target us. All of that being said, it's a very interesting card to give out. Possibly for the more diplomatic version of the deck. Since we, you can use it to get rid of... If a player has gained infinite or near infinite life, if you can break up their combo, you can give... Tree, like Even if your Tree of Perdition dies before you get to do it, you can just give it to somebody else, and eventually they will be able to take the insurmountable life total away so that you don't have to deal all the damage from a single commander to kill them through their infinite life or mill them out. I'm going to add it to the list as a fun card that we might include in the one build of the deck. Three black, zero slash thirteen, plant... Defender, tap to exchange, and OP's life total with this card's toughness. It's Ulrich, who is not anything we care about. Whenever a creature you control with toughness 4 or greater dies, draw a card. Nope. Uh, Skulk and Lifelink. Trample and can transform. Sack three other creatures to transform her. That, I believe, is a blue creature on the front. Enter the battlefield. Put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard. Again, we don't... We're not milling opponents out by giving them mill creatures, so... Reach, cast in center sorcery, deals one damage to target creature and opponent controls. Uh, madness, Whispers of Emrakul, Wolf can bond, 
Every creature you control gets plus three, plus three in Hexproof, uh, three, two Vigilance, and Wretched Griff. So nothing too fancy there. Alright, so that was Eldritch Moon. E for not Eternal Master, so Eventide. So for Eventide, most of the cards we're going to see are going to be black green. Since Eventide is an enemy color, uh, color matters set. So that's, right off the bat, that is interesting because if we give it to an opponent and they sacrifice it, we get it back. It deals three damage to a creature with flying, so it's not going to hurt the bullies. And we can, like, team up to kill a five toughness flying creature. I don't think that's good enough, but it did make me think about what it could potentially do. Each equal the number of creatures in play doesn't untap during its controller's untap step. Yeah, no, we can do better than that. Target white creature gains persist. Ashling is legendary. Tap for mana of each color among permanents you control. As uh, a 6-6 six, six comes into play, choose an opponent, and it gets minus one, minus one for each creature that player has. Uh, Thirst target creature gets minus three, minus three for black, and plus three, plus three to another target for green. Cascade Bluffs is red, blue. Backlash deals damage to target player equal to twice the number of white or blue th that they control. Deals one damage to target player. Cast a red spell on tap it. Remove target card in a graveyard from the game and gain one life. Nope. Also, nope. Uh, Begin of your upkeep. Destroy target creature with a minus one, minus one counter on it. The Eighty of Scars comes in with two counters, and you can remove the counter to regenerate him. And pay a mana, and he, uh, he is a base 7-7 seven, seven Trampler. Comes in play, return to your hand. The creature card in your graveyard with the highest power of two or more are tied for the highest power. Choose one of them. So, this is a 7 mana 10 10 trampler that we could give out. Uh, the drawback will never be relevant. Also, it's not much of a drawback when you're giving your opponent a 10 10 and then they could sacrifice it to gain 10 life later on instead of having to sacrifice one of their other creatures. Um. Probably can do better than this. Destroy target land, gain two life. That has a white red activated ability. 7-7 seven, seven trampler. Uh, target black creature gains wither until end of turn. Hmm. So all the creatures that we're giving out, if they're not, like if we're not giving out the large artifact creatures, are going to be one of our three colors. So the Skulkins are Scarecrows that have an activated ability that benefits a creature of that color. So the black one gives Wither. I'm pretty sure the green one gives Trample, and I forget if the red one gives First Strike or not. But all of these might be... I mean, they're going to be onboard tricks, so all we're doing is discouraging blocking... Uh, so probably not. Creature player equal the number of red mana symbols. So no flame jab, no gift of the deity, no. Uh, comes into play if you control two or more swamps, you may have target player discard a card. Comes into play if you control two or more forests, you may put target card from your graveyard on top of your library. Not interested. Don't really have negative one counter synergies that we would want that. The 
target creature or player. Now, um, haste comes into play, gets plus X plus zero until end of turn, where X is the number of red mana symbols on permanents you control, so no. Uh, green one gives plus one plus one. Hmm. Even as an onboard trick, if we're giving out a lot of green creatures, although I think we're giving out more black creatures than anything else, so the wither one would be the most likely, but all that's doing is making it more difficult for opponents to block without actually stopping them. Like, if they're chump blocking, then it does nothing. Uh, if they're not chump blocking, then it's diminishing their creature. I don't know. Doesn't seem particularly powerful. Uh, comes in play with two minus one minus one counters on it, unless you played another red spell this turn. Uh, three three trample, tap and untap red creature. Um, Pell Giant gets plus X plus zero until end of turn, where X is the power of the creature tapped this way. Um, that is the red one, and it grants haste, which is completely useless. Since we're giving out things with haste anyway, uh, that's an equipment. Uh, fear and persist. Uh, giant comes into play, destroy target island or swamp and opponent controls. Yeah, unfortunate that I could. If this were only islands, mm, probably still not, because then we're just hosing blue players, but. Which is in and of itself not necessary. Uh, tap target player re removes a card in his or her graveyard from the game. Whenever you play a black spell, untap it. Uh, plus four, plus four, and retrace. Uh, that's Necro Skitter. Steals creatures that die with minus one, minus one counters on them. Uh, wither, and whenever this deals combat damage to a player, that player discards that many cards. So this is an example of a tiny saboteur creature. Uh, right now, it's unimpressive since we don't do a lot of creature pumping necessarily. So it would only be one card of the defending player's choice. So, But this is the type of saboteur effect that I was talking about where making the creature unblockable and allowing it to get in would get the triggers, but we need better triggers, I think, than that. Um, yeah, we're not going to run the Hatchling. We're not going to run Trow. Yeah, just kind of moused over those things without thinking about them. Uh, comes into play, it deals damage equal to target creature equal to the number of red mana symbols among permanents you control. Cox's power and toughness are equal to the number of green mana symbols and the mana costs of permanence you control. So, what is it, how many does he have again? One, two, three, four, five, six. So he's naturally a six, six, gets bigger when we give him to green players. He is impossibly hard to cast in our three color deck, even with exceptional mana fixing, so we're probably just going to pass him by anyway. Uh, wither and Persist, no. Sapperling, no. Most of our things have more power than toughness. So we're not getting, like, we're not even thinking about giving him out just as far as a thing we can attack with. The things that we're drawing aren't going to gain us life. And a bunch of them we want to put in the graveyard anyway. That gives Shroud to a blue creature. That's a 4-2 Wither. Uh... Whenever a player plays a non-black spell, that player loses one life. Again, it's not enough of an... Ooh, I just bumped into my mic with my headset. I was trying to adjust my position without making the chair creak too much. Um, that one gives minus one, minus one counters to all creatures in play. So I don't think we need that necessarily. That one changes creatures' colors. Uh, retrace Drain to Life. Uh, target opponent reveals their hand. Choose a green or white creature card. Yeah, we don't care. Uh, also, we don't care about the battalion. 
Uh, haste has trample as long as it has a minus one, minus one counter and has persist. So, yeah, would only have trample the second time. It is a seven power creature with persist that we're forcing them to attack with, so it will likely come back to us as a six one that we get, you know, probably only one shot with, but it's one more shot than we would have had. Hmm. I still don't think it's worth it. Like, it's not particularly good for us to bother casting as just a 7 2. Chroma, power and toughness equal to the number of black mana symbols and mana costs in your graveyard. Unwilling recruit. Uh, Ward of Bones. Comes to play with a minus one, minus one counter. Remove the counter to destroy target artifact or enchantment. And. Wood Lurker Mimic. When you, what happens when you cast the spell? Becomes a 4 5 and gains Wither when you cast a black green spell. So no. And no to the Worm Harvest. So no actual cards from this set. There are a couple cards that I looked at that were interesting, but nothing like super relevant. Persist is kind of interesting because if we give them a creature with Persist and it dies, then we get it back. But I don't think any of the Persist creatures that we saw were particularly good enough to consider for this deck. And none of them really, like, there weren't any of them where I looked at it and went, yeah, that one, like, we get a 1-1 one, one fear back for bothering to give this out to a player, so no. And then there was, like, a troll that's, like, a 2-2 two, two wither. Yeah, wither and persist, so that one's not doing anything. So yeah, none of the Persist creatures in this set really... Maybe there'll be some in Shadowmore that'll be more interesting or relevant to what we're doing. Alright, so that was Eventide. So... After Eventide is Exodus. Uh, comes in play, get a Sorcery back. Uh, damages an opponent. You may reveal cards from your li You may reveal cards from your library until you reveal a land. Put that land in your hand and the others into your graveyard. Giant creature dies. Draw two cards. Uh, upkeep. Lose a life. When Cartographer comes into play, you may return a land from your graveyard to your hand. Black 2, tap, target a p target player chooses and discards a card as a sorcery. Red gets plus 1, plus 0, only if it's blocked. City of Traitors. Coat of Arms. Attacks, defending player chooses an untapped creature. He or she controls that creature, blocks crashing boars this turn if able. So opponent must block, but only with one creature. Um, so... I think that falls in the same category as the other ones. Like, we either want the ones that all of their creatures have to block, or that are just better creatures if we're going to force that. Uh, shadow creatures are notoriously difficult to block, so giving an opponent a shadow creature normally forces it through for damage. But these ones are all super weak. 1-1, one, 2-1, one, one, and power based on the number of shadow creatures. Uh, we'll have to see if there's any of them that are actually, like, threatening enough. Uh, has power and toughness e each equal to the number of cards in target opponent's hand? <clears throat> Uh, Tropic Spectre enters the battlefield, choose an opponent, and Tropic Spectre's power and toughness are equal to the number of cards in the chosen player's hand. Whenever it deals damage to a player, that player discards a card. 
Alright, so this one can potentially be Titanic. The opponent has to choose... The opponent that we're giving it to chooses the player that determines how strong it actually is. Um... It is a mildly evasive creature. Uh, it is a 5-drop as opposed to some of our other things. So this was Exodus. Alright, so this is Entropic Spectre. It is 3 black black. It is a star... Star Spectre Spirit that Flies a PT So Choose an OP as it enters. PT equals cards in that player's hand. When this deals combat damage. Is it combat damage? This is one of the older ones. Yeah, this is just deals damage to a player, because this was back before they had a lot of effects. In fact, I think this was the... Or no, Weatherlight was the set that first had a card that allowed creatures to deal damage. Like, just gave the... Uh, it was like Flame Whip. It was like the first one that allowed the creature to tap to deal a damage. Damage to a player. That player... Discards one. Alright, so we go back. Uh, one tap, return target creature to its owner's hand unless they pay one. Uh, for each blocking creature, flip a coin. If you win the flip, that creature deals no combat damage this turn. Buy back three life and discard a card at random to destroy a land. Target player chooses and discards three cards. A uh, red target creature can't be regenerated this turn. For each one damage dealt to Grawla, each opponent gains one life. Hmm. We put it into play, we force them to attack with it. If it becomes blocked, us and all of the other opponents gain life equal to the power of the creature blocking it. Doesn't seem good enough. So we're going to move on. Hmm. Green tap, make a beast token, only if an opponent controls more creatures. Black tap, destroy a non-black creature, only if that player has at least two fewer creature cards in their graveyard than you. And the red one deals two damage to target opponent, only if that opponent has more life. Discard a card at random, deal one damage to any target. Uh, you can play all of the lands from your hand, and if you do, you discard the rest of your hand. Uh, Enchanted creature gets plus two, plus two, and can't block. Buyback spells are cheaper. Comes in play, choose and discard any number of cards. For each card discarded, put two counters on it. There's Mindless Automaton. Huh. I hear squeaking. We do have a couple mice that have gotten into the house. I don't know if the um, recorder is picking it up. Sounds very distressed. We might have caught him then. Hang on one second. I'm just going to mute.
Hey, and I am back. We did have a mouse. He was caught in the trap, so I had to take care of him. He was very upset. Did not appreciate being evicted. So I had to go get gloves and whatnot and take him outside. And reset the trap. So, back to this. Oh, we were looking at Mindless Automaton. So, Mindless Automaton is a discard outlet that allows us to draw cards. You do have to discard two cards for every additional card you want to draw. Also, you can give him to other players to allow them to draw a card. That's less impressive. It also allows them to discard their hand, like two cards at a time to draw an additional card from him. And we discussed this when we saw him in the um, one of the commander decks. I think I'm going to add Mindless Automaton to the list. It is a card that Automaton This is one of the cards that I like when it goes into a deck. I believe he's a construct now. Uh, artifact, creature, construct. Yep. It's a four mana, zero, zero, construct. ETBs with two plus one counters. One, discard a card to add a counter. Remove two counters to draw one. I do like Mindless Automaton. It is a good discard outlet because it gives you a creature that you can grow and then it's better when you want to discard lots of cards not necessarily draw lots of cards so he is good to just ditch anything that we want in the graveyard and then because we want to put these cards in the graveyard we will put counters on the mindless automaton and then we can draw cards with it and as long as they don't kill it with anything with split second uh, we can always get at least one card back from Mindless Automaton when it's about to die. Hopefully more. Hi, Miri. Uh, flip a coin. If you win the flip, destroy target creature and opponent controls. Otherwise, destroy target creature of that pl of that opponent's choice. Huh. That is an interesting card for Commander. Like... Oh, of that opponent's choice, specifically. So even if we... So if we try and destroy an opponent's creature, they still might not target ours, though, depending on what we had, but that is not for our deck. Uh, can't attack unless you control more lands. Can't block unless you control more lands. Yeah, that's not relevant at all, then. Uh, pay X life, draw X cards. Discard our hand, counter target non-creature spell. The various oaths. We definitely don't want Oath of Druids. That is terrible for us. I don't think any of the oaths are particularly good for us. Discard at random, deal two damage. Uh, whenever you cast a creature spell, tap a creature. Uh, whenever a creature comes into play, that creature's controller may choose to have it deal damage equal to its power to target creature or player. Yeah, we're giving out giant things. We don't want to have pandemonium. If Pit Spawn damages a creature, remove that creature from the game. Doesn't even have to kill it. Or, and gets around indestructible. That's mildly silly. I find that amusing. Don't think it's worth running for that reason, but... Uh, Plated Rootwalla, Price of Progress, uh, Pygmy Troll, Rabid Wolverines... Raging Goblin, comes in play, destroy target non-basic land, no. Uh, attacks and no other creature, other creatures do, it gets plus 3 plus 0 until end of turn. Reclaim, recurring nightmares banned, because it's too much value. 
Sacrifice a Forest to regenerate. 3-2 Flying First Strike. 0 deals 1 damage to each creature without flying. Defending player controls play this ability only if Scalding Salamander is attacking, and only once each turn. Eh. Plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. Seismic Assault, Shattering Pulse. Shattering Pulse is one of my favorite go-to artifact destruction spells because of the buyback. If the opponent can't sacrifice the artifact in response to it or otherwise get it off of the battlefield, then we get to destroy that artifact and then we keep the card for the next artifact and so on. And as long as they're sacrificing it to counter Shattering Pulse, then they're not... Um, then we're still getting a one-for-one, one at the very least. We do have a lot of artifact and enchantment destruction options, thanks to green. I might still include it on this list, though. Usually I wind up running into the core over it, just because I don't need that much artifact disruption, disruption destruction. Trying to portman two of those words together. Instant. I back three. Destroy. And art. Yeah, Shattering Pulse usually winds up getting edged out by Into the Core for. because Into the Core exiles the two artifacts that it targets. So it gets around a lot more of the things that opponents are trying to do to protect their artifacts from removal. You know, you don't have to worry if they tinker out, well not tinker because that's banned, but if they, you know, if Arkham or uh, Muzio, I think is the other guy's name, uh, manages to get uh, Darksteel Forge out so that way they their artifacts are all indestructible, you don't have to worry about that. You can still exile the forge or the more problematic artifacts through the forge and... yeah. Uh, creatures with enchantments on them cannot attack or block because they needed aura hate back then. Auras were so good. Sonic Burst, uh, discard card at random, deal 4 damage, no. Whenever any player successfully casts a spell, deal 2 damage, nope. Cannibal absorbs plus 1, plus 1 counters. Um, maybe counter from Spy Catcher, oh, to regenerate it, okay. Uh, the Rogue can steal counters back, Weaver is the Fog one. Survival of the Fittest. That is true. Survival gives us a way to discard the creatures that we don't want to cast and lets us go get the ones that we do want to cast. Survival of the fittest. Uh, I know there was a judge promo of this one, but... I have not seen it since, and I believe the Judge promo predated the um, closing of the reserve list, which means this is probably a reserve list card, and it is going to be very expensive. Yeah, we put the CMC on the wrong side versus every other thing we've done so far. Yeah, I remember survival. So, Survival of the Fittest, uh, you pay a green, you discard a creature card, and you search your library for a creature card and add it to your hand. And, you, of course, you have to reveal it since you're searching for a specific card type. Uh, Survival was one of the most ridiculous cards when it was printed. Uh, we had just started to see with Vision, so, like, four sets ago, Vision's Temp... Uh, Visions, Weatherlight, Tempest, uh, Stronghold, and Exodus. So five sets ago, we started seeing the first creatures with comes into play abilities, and um, they still hadn't printed a ton of creatures with comes into play abilities, but they had printed enough. 
And so with Survival of the Fittest um, and Recurring Nightmare, which is the other card in this set, those two comboed together to make an absurd toolbox value engine. And then Urza's Saga came out, and you got the creatures that untap lands when they come into play based on their CMC, so things like Great Whale, untap seven lands, so you would sack it to Recurring Nightmare, use three black to cast Recurring Nightmare, um, sack the creature that you got back with Recurring Nightmare to get the whale back, untap, you know, and you could float mana, and so if you had, since you're untapping seven lands, if you actually had seven mana producing lands in play, you had infinite mana while getting infinite comes into play triggers off of the other creature. Even if you only had six lands, you still had infinite comes into play ability, uh, infinite comes into play triggers off of the other creature. So you could very easily kill the opponent. And then they uh, power level, they used to do what was called power level errata, where the card was doing things they hadn't intended for it to do. So they changed its wording to mirror the intent. So uh, cards like Great Whale at the time were errated to if you cast them from your hand, you untap the lands, which dramatically limited their power level and stopped you from doing the recurring survival tricks. Uh, but that it was still a very powerful toolbox deck. Um, it did have to compete with other ridiculous combo decks at the time, because that was when Urza Saga came out, and combo went from a silly thing that required a bunch of cards and was very convoluted and ha had a lot of working pieces, but if you got it to go off, you felt really proud of yourself, to the default way to win a game of Magic for a while, uh, with Tolarian Academy producing obscene amounts of mana. Alright, so I haven't really been looking at what these cards do as I go through this. This one allows you to remove its counters to make Thopters. Uh, you can sacrifice this to look at opponent's hand and discard a card. Uh, turns things into artifacts. Discards a creature to get plus two, plus two until end of turn. Uh, any player may pay five life during their turn to destroy Valras Dungeon. Choose and discard a card. Target player chooses a card in their hand and puts it on top of their library at sorcery speed. Not the card we want in a multiplayer format. Uh, this gives out forest from the deck and workhorse makes mana. Alright. So, nothing else in Exodus, but survival is probably going to make the deck. All right, real quick, I just want to check my uptime. I've been live for almost three hours now. All right, uh, it's going to be dinner time soon anyway. I think three hours is a reasonably long amount of time. We made it through all of the Ds and... What else comes after Exodus? Anything? Explorers of Ixalan, that was the board game that had a couple unique arts in it, I believe. So yeah, we will start off with F, so we will start off with Fallen Empires next time. Let's scroll back up. So Fallen Empires. Alright, quick save, and that'll do it for today. So, if you're watching the VOD for this, since nobody bothered to talk in chat, I hope you enjoyed this, and we will start working with Fallen Empires next time. I don't think there's anything in Fallen Empires that goes into this deck, but then again, I didn't think that we would find so much in Dissension either, so we might be pleasantly surprised. Alright, until next time, thanks for watching.